Of all the historic ships of sail, one in particular flies as fast as a gull before the wind and glides across the water like a cloud skimming the face of the sea, the schooner. Though few vessels could match her for speed or grace, where the schooner excelled like no other sailing ship was in her versatility. In a career that has spanned over 300 years, she has served as a fishing vessel along the jagged New England coastline, as a favorite for smugglers, as a pirate ship, and as a swift and mighty warship. In the late 19th century, she became one of the most widely used cargo vessels of all time, transporting everything from coal and lumber to massive blocks of granite. A rugged schooner named the Bowden even carried brave explorers to one of the most forbidding places on Earth, the Arctic seas of the far north. Considered by many to be the sturdiest wooden ship of all time, the 88-foot-long, 60-ton Bowden had a reinforced hull and an 1,800-pound steel bow plate that allowed her to navigate safely through huge blocks of ice. The schooner's amazing versatility has allowed it to endure the rigors of time and the elements. But there is another reason for its survival, the devotion of those who sail her. From its earliest incarnations, sailors have had a love affair with this splendid ship. She is a sleek craft, crowned with a romantic aura. She has speed and she has grace. She has beauty and she has utility. For a sailing ship, the schooner has it all. She moves smoothly and swiftly across the ocean. And as she makes a turn, she does something no sailing vessel had ever been able to do as effectively. She heads almost directly into the wind. With a square rig vessel, where you mount these great square walls of canvas to catch the wind, they have to be sailing in front of the wind, near the wind. They can be turned to catch the wind, but only so much. And the advantage of the schooner rig, the sails that are going the length of the deck, is that they can catch the wind at a much closer angle. And so as a result, you can sail closer to the wind. You can bring the, the, the ship's bow closer to the direction from which the wind is coming. That imparts a much greater maneuverability. It means you have to tack less often, and you can sail in closer quarters more easily. You can get into smaller ports. You can use those sails nicely on small vessels, and you can use them handily on large vessels as well. You get more choices. You get more versatility. More versatility about how and in what direction you're going to sail, and more places that you can go. Schooners were also more economical to operate for their owners because they needed smaller crews. Schooners had the advantage of requiring fewer men to man the same amount of canvas. These fore and aft sails were easier to hoist from the deck, taking fewer men to do that. And large numbers of men didn't have to climb aloft to do furling and reefing. The rule of thumb for a schooner, even a multi-masted schooner, was you needed a captain and a cook and one man for each mast. Yet these qualities are only part of what makes her special. The beauty of her sleek design catches the eye of all who sail on her. The schooner's captivating charm has propelled her into modern times as a favorite ship among sailing enthusiasts all along the New England coast. What better exponent of the great age of schooners uh, could we have than the schooners of Penobscot Bay. Uh, it's a glorious sight to see their sails spread from horizon to horizon across the bay, knowing that people from around the country and around the world are enjoying the experience of sailing on a true Yankee schooner. Many scholars believe that the origins of the schooner go back to the 17th century in Holland. One tradition is that the ship's name may have derived from the old Dutch word schoon, meaning beautiful, fair, and lovely. Another tradition is American. In 1713, Andrew Robinson was launching a schooner in Gloucester Harbor. And the way she hit the water as she was coming down the ways, she just almost skipped like a stone. And uh, Robinson was noted to have said, there she schoons. And that seems to be a popular rendition of the term. 
However, there is evidence that perhaps the term was used earlier on, but we don't know. Whatever the origins of its name, the schooner probably evolved from the small Dutch fishing craft of the 1600s. Though these early schooners were relatively modest in size and light in construction, making them unable to carry as much cargo as larger sailing ships, their combination of speed, maneuverability, and economy made them extremely popular. Soon, they were the predominant vessel for fishing and coastal trading in northern European waters. By the beginning of the 18th century, the schooner was being widely used by colonial fishermen in New England, who valued the vessel's ability to easily negotiate their ragged coastlines, many coves and bays. By the late 19th century, the ship's continued development and increased speed allowed for more frequent trips to and from the fishing grounds, meaning more hauls for more money. Fishing on the Grand Banks became the staple for the New England uh, market. And schooners would sail out to the Grand Banks and, of course, catch the, their cod, bring the cod on board, and then race back to port. And this was where the great schooner uh, fishing races took place uh, when the uh, schooners wanted to get back to get the best possible uh, price at the fish auction. This same speed and maneuverability quickly made the schooner the favorite vessel for the many smugglers of the area, who needed a craft that could outrun the British naval vessels charged with collecting the colony's import duties and tariffs. And we were big on smuggling in the 1700s, uh, beating the king's taxes. So the schooner achieved great popularity over here on this side. Shipbuilders in Maryland and Virginia modified the schooner for the smugglers, making their draft slightly shallower so the vessels could safely use even the smallest coves and inlets, and adding one or two square sails atop their masts for extra speed. Known as the Virginia model, these were the first American-built schooners. Later during the American Revolutionary War, the British Navy was using a fleet of warships that included schooners to blockade the coast of Massachusetts. With his Continental Army woefully short of food and supplies, General George Washington realized he needed fast and hard-hitting warships of his own to seize British merchant vessels, thereby feeding his own men while starving the enemy. The ship he turned to was the schooner. Without the knowledge of the Continental Congress, which had yet to form a navy, he met with a man named Colonel John Glover in Cambridge, who owned three merchant schooners. Glover agreed to lease Washington the Hannah, named after Glover's wife. Slightly larger than the other schooners of her day, the Hannah weighed 78 tons. Glover ordered carpenters to transform her into a formidable fighting vessel. They cut gun ports into her side and added four carriage-mounted cannon. Twelve swivel guns were mounted on the ship's rail. The next step was hiring a crew. To command the vessel, Glover recommended Nicholson Broughton, a shipmaster of 20 years and an expert with the schooner. Instead of just the few men who were needed to sail a regular schooner, Glover required a crew of 43 to help man the ship's guns. He paid them small wages, but added the extra incentive of a third of any captured booty to be split among the officers and crew. This offer enticed no one more than Broughton. On her maiden voyage as a warship, the Hannah captured an American vessel that had recently been taken by the British. But instead of returning the ship to its rightful owner, Broughton tried to claim it as a legitimate prize. When Washington learned the truth of the matter, he promptly returned the vessel to her captain. Nicholas Broughton, the first skipper of Hannah, was picked for reasons we don't know. We know he was a subordinate officer of, of uh, John Glover's command. It was Glover's ship, the Hannah, that was taken in, and Glover was the infantry regiment commander. And Broughton turned out, really, to have no understanding at all about the whole situation. Every capture he made was invalidated. As a result, his crew got no prize money as they had been promised. They mutinied, everything went wrong, and uh, Washington let Broughton's commission die at the end of the calendar year. And that was goodbye to Nicholas Broughton. Despite Broughton's failure, Washington had seen the need for naval forces. And he still had faith in the schooner's ability to carry out his plans. Eventually, he would find a man who had the leadership necessary to see his vision through. 
and the ability to help catapult the budding colonial navy into a powerful military force, a force that would build its foundation on the swift and agile form of the schooner. November 1775. The chill of winter began to set heavy over Boston Harbor when Captain John Manley of the American schooner Lee spotted an armed British vessel named the Nancy, which he suspected was carrying an abundance of military provisions. Manley considered attacking her, but firing his guns would make his presence known to other British ships in the area. He needed a plan of capture. If he failed, it could mean the end of Washington's fledgling navy of schooners, and quite possibly the struggling colonists' fight for liberty. At the time, the Continental Army was at a low ebb of supplies and morale. Washington's schooners had yet to capture a significant prize. But during Nicholson Broughton's rapacious campaign, General Washington had acquired two additional schooners. He had hoped to find a commander who would utilize them in the way he had intended, as swift predators that would sweep down on British ships to secure badly needed supplies for the colonial army. In Captain John Manley, Washington finally found the leadership he needed. He had a way with men that was very, very important. Manley was able to recruit people who were seasoned mariners and who knew their stuff. 42 years old, Manley had a wealth of experience as a merchant captain along the New England coast. Washington gave him command of the Lee, which was outfitted with similar rigging and sails as the Hannah. After Glover added 10 cannon to her deck, she became an equally potent warship as well. Unlike Broughton, Manley achieved instant and legitimate success. Correspondence that bore the seal of King George III was discovered aboard the second vessel he captured. The letter stated that the British were about to send an army of over 22,000 men to combat the fledgling American rebellion more than doubling their forces in the colonies. Washington now redoubled his efforts to harass the British at sea. Instead of limiting the attacks of his schooners to supply vessels, any ship flying the flag of Britain was now open for capture. While the letters Manley took were significant strategically, Washington's forces were still in desperate need of supplies. It was then that Manley sighted the Nancy off Boston Harbor. Seeking a way to successfully attack the heavily armed vessel, Manley was unwittingly offered the opportunity by the Nancy's captain. When the Englishman saw Manley's schooner approaching, he assumed she was a pilot boat, a ship designated to transport the pilot who would help guide his vessel into the harbor. It was a natural assumption, since the handy schooners were often used as pilot boats. When the Nancy signaled for the Lee to come alongside, Manley played along. Once aboard the Nancy, Manley's men drew their pistols on the unsuspecting crew, quickly capturing her, along with enough arms and equipment to outfit 2,000 soldiers. John Manley hit the jackpot when he took the brig Nancy, which had all sorts of winter clothing. It had two large caliber mortars and had lots of muskets and ammunition. It was really a, a Christmas wish list come true. Washington's supply problems were instantly alleviated and Manley and his men received high praise for their actions. Impatient to pursue similar actions, Manley immediately set sail. Over the following weeks, he successfully repeated the pilot ruse several times, once capturing the 400-ton three-masted Jenny, a magnificent prize for Manley's 74-ton Lee. By the end of 1775, Washington was operating five schooners in his small fleet and John Manley was by far his best captain. Washington was now determined to completely clear Boston Harbor of the British Navy. Manley was promoted to Commodore and given command of a squadron of four schooners, including his flagship, the refurbished Hancock. He had her cargo area converted to fit a crew of 60, plus extra guns and ammunition. On the main deck sat six cannon. 10 swivel guns lined the rails. In the spring of 1776, the Hancock came upon the pride of the local Royal Navy, a brigantine named the Hope. Manley knew his schooner alone would never be able to overpower the larger and more ruggedly constructed brig, a type of two-masted vessel which had square sails on the foremast 
and schooner-type sails mounted aft. Instead, he used the Hancock's speed to provoke a chase. Catching the wind skillfully, he maneuvered for three hours, eventually gliding into shallow water where the bigger enemy vessel couldn't pursue her to close range. After a prolonged and inconclusive long-distance gunnery duel, both ships retired to fight another day. That day came a month later when Manley once again spotted the Hope. This time, he had three other American schooners with him. Using their superior speed and maneuverability, Manley's schooners swooped in on the British vessel two at a time, swiftly raking her with cannon fire, then darting away before the enemy ship could effectively bring her greater firepower to bear. After 30 minutes of this running gunplay and some extensive damage to her hull, the Hope retreated, leaving Manley and his flotilla victorious. Washington's small navy was now carrying the battle for the British and winning. In 1777, when the last of Washington's eight original vessels were decommissioned, they had racked up an impressive 55 captures and had been instrumental in forcing the British out of Boston. Most of those captures had been accomplished by schooners. For the few months that, that Washington had his Navy, the schooners did exactly what he ex intended them to do, and that was break up British supply lines to Boston and if, if possible, bring the stuff in so the Continental Army could use it. In that, they were, they were successful. Though he knew little about ships, George Washington had understood the importance of sea power and had used it to impressive effect. A little over 30 years later, a new incarnation American sea power would face the British once again. And once again, the Yankee schooners would have a chance to prove themselves in combat. September 1813. American squadron commander Oliver Hazard Perry stood aboard his flagship, awaiting the enemy a few dozen miles away. Anticipation for a decisive battle for control of Lake Erie had been building for over a year. With winter closing in, the time had finally arrived. As the British sailed out to engage the Americans, Perry knew that the outcome could help decide the fate of the War of 1812. Since 1793, Great Britain had been at war with France. With its forces depleted by the long, drawn-out conflict, the British began stopping American ships and taking U.S. sailors into its ranks by force. Partly due to this illegal impressment, along with British interference in American trade on the high seas, President James Madison urged Congress to declare war in June of 1812. Lake Ontario and Lake Erie as well as their connective rivers were strategically vital during the campaign. If the British seized them by moving south from their bases in Canada, they would gain control of a waterborne artery straight into the American heartland. Maintaining a hold on these critical waterways was essential to the U.S. war effort. The St. Lawrence River and the Great Lakes uh, formed a highway pointed at what we were calling in those days our Northwest Territories, what are today Michigan, Illinois, Ohio, Wisconsin, that whole area. And the British had designs on that. The British had always had designs on that, and indeed, uh, in the peace treaty after the revolution had kind of set things up that this would be an area of confrontation and conflict in future years. At this time, the American Navy was still a comparatively modest force, consisting of a handful of ocean-going frigates and other warships. On the lakes, the U.S. naval presence was even less imposing. At the time, the U.S. Navy had one vessel on Lake Ontario and none on Lake Erie, none on Lake Champlain, or the other lakes. Uh, so it was virtually start from scratch. The lack of ships posed a tremendous challenge for the officers responsible for building an American fleet on the lakes. As these men arrived at their stations, they began procuring vessels from the available supply, among them merchant schooners, which were fitted with armament until larger ships could be built. Lake schooners were constructed differently than their seagoing counterparts. The lakes were only suitable for sailing half the year due to winter ice formations. Even during good sailing weather, the winds tended to be weaker and shifted more often than those on the open ocean. So lake schooners were built lighter with taller masts and larger sails. 
Though these features allowed for greater speed and mobility in the mildest breezes, they also made the vessels vulnerable to capsizing in gusty winds. The addition of guns only increased their top heaviness. Despite these drawbacks, however, the schooners had some advantages on the landlocked lakes. They were still faster than the larger ships that sometimes plied inland waters. And their keen maneuverability in the shallows close to shore made them highly effective in protecting the forts surrounding the lakes. Leading the American campaign on the Great Lakes was Commodore Isaac Chauncey. Chauncey's plan was basically to settle matters on Lake Ontario and gain control of it, then move over and take the same measures on Lake Erie. Uh, as things turned out, it didn't work that way. In pursuit of his goal, Chauncey dispatched officers to Lake Ontario to acquire ships. Chauncey himself arrived at his headquarters at Sackets Harbor, New York in October of 1812 and promptly sailed his squadron to attack the British base across the lake at Kingston in Canada. Commanding his six schooners from aboard his flagship, the Brig Oneida, Chauncey burned one enemy vessel and captured another. But the engagement failed to decisively defeat the British on the lake. It was a pattern that would be repeated throughout the war. So Chauncey achieves nothing except use up a lot of supplies and make constant demands for more men and more equipment and nothing happened. American efforts on Lake Erie would prove far more effective. Earlier, Chauncey had assigned Master Commandant Oliver Hazard Perry to lead a fleet at Erie, Pennsylvania. When he arrived at his base, Perry faced the same lack of ships that bedeviled Chauncey's campaign on Lake Ontario. He would have to work quickly to build a fleet sufficient to seize the lake from the British force that then controlled it. However, Perry was fortunate enough to be accompanied by Noah and Adam Brown, noted shipbuilders out of New York. Lacking the materials found in traditional shipbuilding centers, the Browns skillfully improvised with local resources. Using green timber from the trees surrounding the lake and wooden pegs instead of metal spikes, the Browns were able to successfully construct two brigs and three new schooners to complement the ships that were already fitted before Perry's arrival. But the regional materials made for a weaker structure, and the new ships were only strong enough to endure a limited number of engagements. Perry faced another more immediate obstacle as well getting his larger ships past a sandbar that separated the town's harbor from the lake. But none of these problems seemed to deter the aggressive American commander. Perry emptied his ships, then used pontoons that the Browns constructed and transported them over the sandbar one by one. Taken off guard by the move, the British commander, Commodore Robert Barclay, withdrew his fleet to gather reinforcements. Though Perry now had apparent command of the lake, he knew it would only be a matter of time before the British returned to fight. A few weeks later, Perry was proven right when American lookouts spotted Barclay's force approaching. It was for pressing his case, and he was so relieved to see the approaching British fleet. Finally, after months of planning and months of training, the Americans used schooners to start an early engagement thus allowing the brigs to come out into the action. Perry aligned his nine ships for battle, among them five schooners. With the banner, don't give up the ship, whipping atop his flagship's mast, Perry's three largest ships opened fire. For two solid hours, both sides pounded away at each other. Two of Perry's larger vessels were ravaged, including his own flagship. After safely transferring by rowboat to the brig Niagara, Perry courageously continued the fight. With his schooners standing by to offer support, he commanded his little fleet through three more hours of combat. He took the Niagara, sailed it around the offside of the damaged Lawrence, brought it across Lawrence's bow, and was proceeding to cross the British bows. And he threw them into such confusion the Queen Charlotte hit the Detroit, they got snarled together, bungled it all up, he proceeded to shoot them to pieces, and the whole British squadron ultimately surrendered. Standing proudly aboard the Niagara, Perry scribbled off his famous message to headquarters. We have met the enemy, and they are ours. 
the Americans retained control of Lake Erie until the end of the war. The Battle of Lake Erie was instrumental in helping the United States win what many have called its second war of independence. And the Yankee schooners had been an important element in the campaign that led to America's ultimate victory on the Great Lakes. The result of the Battle of Lake Erie was the U.S. gained strategic control of the lake. The Northwest Territories were protected. Uh, the British could no longer do anything there. After the war, the schooner returned to its original service as a merchant vessel. But its reign was far from over. Indeed, it was destined to become one of the driving forces that would propel America into the modern age. In the years following the War of 1812, innovative iron and steam-powered ships started to appear throughout the maritime world beginning a long challenge to the supremacy of wooden sailing ships. Then two consecutive events breathed new life into the schooner. The first was the Civil War, which destroyed scores of American ships. The second was the World Industrial Revolution, which thrust the United States into a period of unprecedented economic expansion. With a rapidly growing need for cargo ships to deliver goods and raw materials to the booming cities of the Northeast, and few ships of any kind to meet the demand, shippers turned to the schooner to fill the void. Easier to build and cheaper to operate than either larger sailing ships or the fuel-hungry early steamers, the schooner entered a new era, a period when she would thrive and grow with the rest of the country. During this time, the schooner hauled anything and everything as long as there was money to be made. In 1820, a crew off Kennebec, Maine pulled chunks of ice aboard their ship and sold it for $700 in Baltimore. With this sale, a business was born, and soon, schooners were being built solely for the ice trade. Kennebec River ice uh, up near Richmond, north of Bath, was absolutely beautiful and pure. So much so that by the 1880s, in one year, 650,000 tons of ice was transported from uh, the Kennebec River above Bath, Maine, out to uh, southern ports, South America, and then, of course, ice was being transported all the way out to Calcutta. By 1890, an astonishing three million tons of ice were shipped on schooners to locations all over the world icing the drinks and cooling the rail cars of the wealthy. But it was because of the Industrial Revolution's building boom that the schooners truly prospered. Building materials such as lumber, granite, and stone were needed everywhere, and the schooner could carry them all. Granite from Penobscot Bay and the Penobscot River uh, was used for the base of the Brooklyn Bridge. Columns were used uh, in St. John the Divine in New York City. Gorgeous eagles used on uh, the uh, Penn Station as well as in the public buildings in Buffalo. Tall timber was being shipped to the sawmills almost faster than it could be cut. To accommodate the long tree trunks, ports were built into the schooner's bows, enabling crewmen to put the lumber directly into the hull. Ships were often loaded down so heavily that they would pull into a harbor with the crew knee-deep in water which had leaked into the hold. But the buoyant lumber below deck helped keep the vessels afloat. Though seepage could be perilous to any ship, one particular cargo provoked more fear of this hazard than any other, lime, which was used to make mortar and plaster. This is lime rock, or limestone, but this stone is not shipped as it is. It has to be burned. And after days of being burned uh, in the kill, it changes its chemical composition and becomes what's called slack lime. The only problem with the resultant slack lime is that it was highly volatile and would burn if it came in contact with salt water. Now, if they were caught in a storm and salt water were to seep down through the decks or through the hatches, the resulting fire was horrific. Well, sometimes the fire was so hot they had to scuttle the vessel. 
Limers, as these schooners came to be known, were constructed with the utmost safety in mind. Thicker bottoms made of extra stout planking were built into the hulls to prevent any water from leaking into the hold. Seams were caulked with extra care, but no matter how well these ships were made, the sea always had the final say. Storms and reefs were constant threats, and since a burning limer was restricted from entering a harbor for fear of the fire spreading to other ships, their crews were forced to extinguish the flames on their own. While the schooner was helping to fuel America's new prosperity, America's growth was just as important to the expanding use and dimensions of the schooner. Coal was the dominant fuel of the day, and the schooner was essential to its distribution. But in order to make this business profitable, shippers needed larger vessels than the average two-masted schooner, which could only carry 150 tons of coal. While hundreds of two-masted schooners maintained their roles as fishing vessels and cargo carriers, it wasn't long before three-masted schooners became more common in the waters along the Atlantic coast. These three-masted ships weighed anywhere from 500 to 600 tons, compared to the two-masters, which tended to weigh no more than 250 tons. But ship owners still wanted their schooners to carry more. Suddenly, the race was on for bigger, stronger schooners. In 1880, the first four-masted schooner was launched. At 17 feet deep, its hold could be filled with 1,450 tons of coal. And by 1890, four-masters were able to haul 2,500 tons of coal. The only thing that would limit the size of a schooner would be the practical considerations of how many men you could have manning the thing and how much cargo you actually wanted to carry at a given time. Um, it's like the analogy of a pickup truck versus an 18-wheeler. Sometimes a pickup truck is what you want to carry a few bags of sand or gravel or some lumber, and sometimes it would be a whole 18-wheeler you'd want for a real commercial cargo. And uh, the schooners were the same way. There were small ones for small jobs, and there were very big ones indeed for big jobs. With the advent of the four-masted schooner, sails became more expansive and heavier. And crews found it more difficult to manage a ship that was once known for its ease of operation. Larger crews were needed, and this did not bode well for a company's profits. It seemed the size of the schooner had finally peaked. This dilemma was temporarily resolved when a schooner captain named David O'Keefe mounted a steam-powered device called a donkey engine on his ship. I think the name refers to the amount of work that a donkey could do, a, a stationary engine located uh, almost invariably on deck in the forward house. Originally, they had uh, a steam engine. And it was fired up occasionally when they needed help handling cargo or handling the anchor or getting the sails up. Uh, it was possible with a small steam engine to run a winch that could do the work of a dozen people. The enormous advantage the donkey engine provided allowed schooners to be built even bigger. And in 1888, a five-master was christened. A decade later, six masters with hulls measuring over 340 feet and capable of hauling 5,000 tons of coal were afloat. The ever-growing schooner finally culminated with the construction of the enormous seven-masted Thomas W. Lawson in 1902, which was nearly 400 feet long and displaced close to 5,000 tons. The problem with the Thomas W. Lawson is that she was so massive you couldn't tack her. Uh, there was also a big controversy about the names of the masts, so much so that finally the captain said, let's just call them one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, or Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And so that's how they solved that controversy. The Lawson was so tremendous that she completely lost a schooner's traditional agility and was wrecked in 1907. All during this heyday of the schooner era, the use of iron and steam-powered ships continued to rise. With an iron ship's greater durability, the owners of wooden schooners were forced to pay higher insurance premiums than their metal rivals. To compete, schoonermen had to cut their rates dramatically sail with fewer crew and accept what little cargo they could. As a result, the schooner became less and less profitable and by 1908, 
they had been eclipsed as competitors on the world's trade routes. With the exception of a small resurgence during the First World War, which created a sudden need for cargo ships of all kinds, schooners were no longer being built as freight-carrying vessels. But for a few specialized uses, there was still a place for the versatile and durable schooner. As the schooner pushed through the frigid water, chunks of ice knocking against her hull, the captain felt the stirring of a spirit from the past. The ship, named the Bowden, was returning to the harbor that bore her name 70 years after her maiden voyage, a precarious trip for which she had been specifically designed. The Bowden's original captain, Donald McMillan, was born in 1874 in Provincetown, Massachusetts. His father was a schooner fisherman, and young Macmillan was raised around boats. In 1908, Macmillan accompanied the famous explorer Robert Peary on one of his expeditions to the Arctic. Donald Macmillan had been a young school teacher at Worcester Academy when invited by Admiral Peary to go on that expedition north in which Peary came as close to the pole as anyone at that particular time. When Macmillan returned, he was so fascinated by the Arctic that he joined many other expeditions. Now a seasoned Arctic explorer, Macmillan decided it was time to build a ship of his own. The type he settled on was a schooner modeled after the famous fishing schooners of New England. But the similarities ended there, as the uniquely dangerous conditions in the Arctic required an equally unique vessel to withstand them. And so he determined to build a vessel that would be the strongest wooden ship of its type afloat. She was framed with white oak that was very, very thick. Below the water line, they had uh, two and three inch planking. Then she was sheathed with green heart, which is a very, very hard wood. And then in her bow, they had an iron beak that was added to the bow that would allow her to hit the ice with terrific force and still survive. On April 9th, 1921, Macmillan christened her the Bowden in honor of his alma mater, Bowden College. In July, she set off on her maiden voyage to the Arctic as a scientific expeditionary vessel to chart Canada's northern waters. It wasn't long before the Bowden structure received its first test. After crossing over the imaginary boundary marking the Arctic Circle, she continued through packs of ice, her iron bow grinding against the frozen plates. Then when she finally found open water, a giant chunk of ice called a growler suddenly rose from the sea right in front of her. One of the uh, helmsmen was responding to commands from Macmillan up on the, in the ice barrel, and Mac said, uh, turn, turn, and of course he turned the wrong direction, and uh, he uh, hit a growler head on. The sturdy schooner merely bounced off the ice and continued on, solid and serene. Later, the Bowden and her crew settled in for the long Arctic winter in an undiscovered inlet on the Canadian coast that Macmillan promptly named Bowden Harbor. 247 days after their arrival, the ice finally broke and the Bowden headed triumphantly for home. A year later, on her second expedition, the Bowden was put to the ultimate test a test tragically failed by so many other vessels that challenged the forbidding Arctic winter. Macmillan studied in those years when he was in the far north all of the exploration vessels that had been used over the years, and he determined that the only vessel that could survive would be a vessel with a V-shaped hull, so that when the ice pressed in on the hull, the vessel would, would rise up and then sort of gently rest on her side wouldn't be crushed by the ice. Soon after the Bowden's arrival at her wintering destination in northern Greenland's refuge harbor, the sea froze solid around the helpless vessel. Her crew could only wait and watch as thousands of tons of ice shifted below their feet. But Macmillan's foresight paid off, and the Bowden's hull slipped up and out of the crushing ice to rest safely on her side. They were frozen in for an incredible 325 days before the ice thawed and they were able to set sail. 
The Bowden made numerous other trips to the Arctic with Mac McMillan at the helm. But with the onset of World War II in 1941, he sold the Bowden to the Navy for hydrographic surveying off the jagged shores of Greenland. After the war, uh, Bowden was abandoned by the Navy. She ended up in a, in a shipyard near Quincy, Massachusetts, and she was stripped. Unable to let the Bowden die, Mac bought her back for $4,000. And when Mac found the Bowden, they had to uh, get an agreement from the Navy that they could put her back together again. And it almost broke his heart to see the, the tough shape that the vessel was in. Donald McMillan restored his beloved vessel and in 1954, at the age of 80, he took his last trip aboard the Bowden, sailing with his wife Miriam and several students to Labrador and Greenland. Five years later, he sold her again to the Mystic Seaport Museum. In 1968, she was acquired by the Schooner Bowden Association, where over a period of nearly two decades, several restorations were undertaken by teams of professionals and volunteers. By 1985, she had been lovingly returned to her former glory and was one of the first sailing ships officially certified to carry student trainees on ocean voyages under the Sailing School Vessels Act. In 1988, she was acquired by the Maine Maritime Academy to serve as a sail training ship. Finally, in 1991, with the cold nipping at her sails, she made her historic trek back to Greenland via Bowdoin Harbor, whose name had since been changed to Schooner Harbor, a testament to these brave and glorious ships. After over half a century, the Bowdoin had finally come home. Now she's a sail training ship, just as she was intended to be, and at the Maine Maritime Academy, she'll have a long and, and a brilliant future. Schooners continue to glide across the waters off Maine. They have long since been replaced as warships, but they continue to carry cargo. Only now the cargo is passengers. Every summer, all along the New England coast, their spread of sail fills the sky as they take sailing enthusiasts and vacationers for one of the most thrilling and satisfying adventures of their lives. Ships like the Lewis R. French, built in 1871, the oldest commercial sailing vessel in America. The Grace Bailey, built in 1882. The 170-foot-long three-masted Victory Chimes, which was built in 1900. The speedy and graceful 120-foot Mary Day. And of course, the Bowden herself. These craft have long outlasted their original builders and owners and their splendor and charm continue to endure through the entrepreneurial efforts of the local families who own and operate them. The last schooner culture in the world, they preserve not only the boats, but the glorious heritage of the New England schooners. Those fortunate enough to have sailed on one of these vessels cannot help but be captivated by their amazing beauty. Schooners are absolutely inspirational. There's nothing like looking up at the sky and seeing those sails rising the, the creak of the halyards to the blocks, uh, feeling the wind on your face as they first begin to gather way, and you know that you're in a vessel completely unaffected by any power but the power of the wind. It is this bewitching quality that helps ensure the continued survival of these graceful vessels. For as long as the wind breathes life into their sails, the schooners will live on.